What's going on, everybody? It's Max the Catfish, and today we are here with episode four in our beginner's tutorial series for Solaris here in 2022. If you haven't seen the last three episodes, we have taken a look at everything from your first steps in space to what the different resources are and how we use them. Everything from how to use edicts and how to gain traditions using Unity. And today we're taking a look at how do we actually administrate the more uh, planetary side of our empire, if you will. We've got a whole bunch of planets out there for us to gather, but when we have them, what do we do with them, right? We're gonna find out today. Let's jump into it. So we've got a, uh, a planet here, Alpha Centauri 3, that's almost fully colonized, one year more, and we should have a pretty good grasp on the planet at that point. But while that's been colonizing, a couple things have been happening on Earth. And I explained in the last tutorial, I have not been playing Solaris the right way. I've been explaining a lot of concepts to you, but I've been glossing over a lot of things and I haven't come to the full explanation of everything that there is because there is a lot, a lot to explain. But we've got Earth here, right? It's been our home colony and our, and our, our home, really, of the human species for as long as we can remember. In the outliner, We've got a couple of icons here that are giving us a little bit of an alert. They're saying, hey, something's wrong. Something's wrong on Earth, especially this red one. Something's wrong on Earth and you need to go and make sure that you fix it. That's your job, right? As leader of the, of the Earth and human species, right? And so I clicked on the Earth little button here on the outliner and this brought us to the planetary administration panel. Now, when you're playing your game in Solaris, you should take a look at this way sooner than I have in this tutorial series, but I put it off because there's a lot to learn about the game and some of the concepts before you start working on planets because there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of buttons, there's a lot of things you should be aware of. Let's start at the top. We've talked a lot already about the habitability of planets. A planet's habitability determines how productive and happy your species are living on that planet. You could send humans down to a living hellhole that's just horribly inhabitable. It's got terrible monsters, it doesn't have any oxygen, but they won't necessarily be particularly happy there. And as their happiness decreases, it may turn to a revolt. They may revolt against your empire or leave the planet altogether or just die. That's up to you to make smart decisions about how you're choosing and picking the planets that your, your species should live on. Next to that is the planetary size. I explained in a pre previous tutorial that this determines the maximum number of districts that you can build on that planet. Districts are this panel here in the middle left side of the planetary view. And for you already, the game will create a bunch of districts on your home planet, but new colonies will have no districts built and they're up to you to decide how you'd like to build them. In my opinion, it makes a lot of sense for you to specialize planets into a specific thing, right? It would be really good for you to have a planet just based on producing energy and a planet just based on producing minerals. But when you're first starting out, obviously that's not very possible. You have to meet the needs of your entire civilization, your entire galactic empire. And then you can start the specialization of planets over time. In my experience, your capital planet starts as a jack of all trades, and then slowly but surely, very carefully, you can start specializing it to do something very specific if you'd like to. Planetary traits are found just below your uh, size and your habitability here. And sometimes those traits are positive, sometimes they're negative. If we take a look at Alpha Centauri, we saw that there's actually both a positive trait, which we found from an anomaly, and a negative trait, which is this is not the place to make food, right? We can already tell that because the maximum number of districts, of agriculture districts that we can build on this planet is three. That means in effect that the planet's earth, the minerals in the planet are really weak. They're not really suitable for producing food. Don't produce food on this planet. It's as easy as that. But going back to earth, on the right side, let's take a look at this panel. This is a really quick indication of how good are you playing the game? I'm playing it pretty badly actually right now because we're in tutorial mode. We can see some red numbers here, 
And that is an indication that I'm not doing something right. Yellow numbers we talked about are kind of like, uh, it's not that you're doing a bad thing, but you should be doing a little bit better, right? And, and it is a really quick indication of how you can fix some of these things on your planet. Every single planet, you should give this panel some attention and understand what's going on every so often, like every 30 minutes, every hour, just check in on your planets. Even in the outliner, you can really quickly see what their progress is and just check in on them and see what's going on. So let's start at the top of here with stability. Stability is an indication of how stable is your population on your planet? This is a combination of everything from the habitability to their happiness to do they have consumer goods, right? The resource that we talked about that is like the luxury goods for your population. Do they have enough amenities, which are things like drinkable water and nice roads and public transportation? Are you keeping up on these things or just things like an entertainment? area for them to hang out and, and let off steam so that it's not all about work, right? All of these elements feed into your stability, including crime, which can grow on a planet that is unhappy. If you're not producing enough places for people to have amenities, or if you're not producing enough housing for your population, crime will start to grow. People are living on the streets. They're living in, in situations that are destitute, and that's going to grow a criminal population that is going to create less stability on your planet. If crime grows too high or stability drops too low, you may see your planets in all out revolt against you or may have riots or terrible things happen on them. So you should make sure that you keep your population happy and on planets that are actually habitable for them, right? So we talked about crime. Housing is our next number here. And this just shows how much housing do we have available for new population. If you are lacking housing, this number will be negative. And that means you need to make houses for your pops or they're going to be quite upset with you. Housing comes from a series or a combination of districts and some buildings. Some buildings feature housing on them as well. But districts are typically the main way that you gain housing. If you scroll over any of these districts, all of them produce an amount of housing and all of them produce an amount of jobs as well, which is what keeps your population employed. Your agriculture, mining districts, and generator districts by default produce two housing and produce two jobs. So you could just build on a perfect world. You could build all of these districts and you'd have an equal number of houses and jobs. Your city districts produce five housing, which is a lot more, and produce one job. So they are used to make up for a lack of housing if you've got too many jobs on your planet, but not enough housing. They also unlock a building slot, which I'm going to cover in just a little bit. But just know that city districts are a really quick way of fixing a housing issue if you have a housing issue on your planet. Industrial districts, similar to the ones that preceded them, they have two housing and they've got two jobs. One job that is used to turn minerals into consumer goods and one job that is used to turn minerals into alloys. We're going to touch on jobs right in a second here, but you'll notice that I've got actually a problem. I've got no available jobs. I'm lacking jobs for our population to perform. Not only that, I have two pops that don't have jobs and I should probably do something to fix that. A really quick way to fix this is by creating a new district, right? And by creating a new district, we can really quickly get these population that don't have jobs into jobs for them. Now, we talked a little bit about specialization and how Alpha Centauri is a perfect planet to be specialized into generator districts. So when I'm looking at Earth, I probably don't want to build a generator district. I think that would be that would be a bad move. I could build a mining district, but I have an income of 43 mining already. Like that's, that's pretty good. I could build an agriculture district and it wouldn't be a bad thing to do necessarily, but maybe the better thing to do is to look at the fact that we have only a income of two consumer goods, which is quite low. And remember that the industrial district turns minerals and turns them into consumer goods and turns them into alloys. So we could create a new industrial district, take from our massive surplus of minerals 
and generate some consumer goods and some alloys by doing so. I think that would be a really smart move. Alternatively to building an industrial district is we could build buildings. Now you have a number of building slots up to, I believe, what is this? This is 12 total. And we could instead build buildings which have sometimes similar roles to your districts and sometimes kind of competing roles to your districts instead. You'll notice that we could build on this planet an alloy foundry and the alloy foundry doesn't produce any housing, but it produces two jobs that turn minerals into alloys. That's pretty juicy, honestly. If I really wanted to get more alloys, and I always do, I would build an alloy foundry there. Or potentially, maybe because we have already five extra housing on this planet, maybe I want civilian industries. It's gonna create two artisan jobs that produce consumer goods by consuming minerals. That would be pretty sweet. And this could be a planet where we really focus in on the production of consumer goods and alloys, maybe both or maybe just one. I think that would be a really smart place to start. So I'm gonna build a civilian industries on this planet. At the bottom here, of course, we have how long it takes to build the building and how many minerals it takes to build it. Your buildings and your districts are, are created from minerals. So keep that in mind. Minerals, I told you, are the building blocks of your planets and of your empire. So always, always, always keep an eye on your income of minerals. But we're gonna build a civilian industries, which is gonna take 360 so days. Let's drop down now and take a look at a few last things on planets. In the middle here is your planetary production. It shows you what your planet produces, pretty straightforward. This is really nitpicky. It's really looking at like, how many energy credits are you creating? How many minerals are you creating? But you can always look in the upper left-hand corner at these resources and just see that at a quick glance. Remember, resources that are produced on a planet are shared with your entire empire. So you don't have to transfer any resources from one planet to the other. But it is good for you to specialize planets because you're gonna get a massive benefit in doing so. So that's what Earth has got going on. Let's take a look at the population tab for one second. The population tab tells you how are your population divided by strata and what jobs are they actually performing? On the bottom right hand side, we've got the fact that we only have humans on this planet, but if we had multiple species, we would see a bunch of different species take up a percentage of the pie chart, depending on how many lived on the planet. Right now, it's 100% human. On the left side, we've got the jobs available on this planet. You'll see that one of these numbers is red because we have two workers. This is the lowest strata, the lowest on the, on the uh, tier of, of employees that are unemployed. And we have each of the jobs that are available on this planet, made available by the districts that you have and the buildings that you've built on that planet there. So we've got six farmers that are producing 8.3 food. We've got four miners that are producing 5.5 minerals. And all of these jobs are full up. There's no extra vacancy. There's no extra availability. There are times, there will be many times actually, most of the time, that you have more jobs than you have workers. And you can actually allocate workers specifically to specific jobs by expanding the drop down arrow and using the plus and minus to increase or decrease the number of jobs available in that role. So this is a hypothetical, I can't really show it right now, but let's say that we had way too much food and we really needed miners. I could decrease the number of farmers and farming jobs available on my planet. And that would encourage our workers to work as miners if there were available mining jobs. There aren't right now, so I'm gonna just increase these numbers, re-employ our, our farmers, and everybody's happy. This is a micromanagey element of Solaris. You can get into some trouble adjusting these numbers too much. So for new players, I wouldn't recommend doing it. But the one thing that I'll recommend for you is if it feels like you are in trouble, maybe you're not producing enough minerals, but you have a ton of mineral jobs, you have a ton of mining jobs and nobody's taking them and you can't figure out why, you can actually click on one of these jobs 
and it will prioritize that job over all others. It will prioritize your workers to go and work as a miner before they work as a farmer or before they work as a clerk. And that will help your economy stabilize itself in times where it seems like people aren't really doing what they're supposed to be doing, despite all the work and effort you've made to create jobs in that region. So just keep that in mind. One last thing to know about workers is workers love promotions and they will do whatever it takes to be promoted from one tier to the next tier above. The worker tier is the lowest tier. They are your farmers, they're your miners, they're your people working in factories, but they would much rather be working in comfy jobs where they're sitting at a desk, working on research, they get paid more, they have better amenities, and they will automatically promote themselves into jobs that are available in the specialist tier if made available. So if you make more jobs like we're doing, we're making two artisan jobs from our, what is it called? Is it civilian industries, right? We're making two new artisan jobs. Two workers that are unemployed at this tier are going to step up and step into jobs in the artisan tier. That sounds great. But if you build too many specialist jobs and your workers all get promoted to specialists, guess where they don't wanna go? They don't wanna be demoted down to workers again. They will over time if forced to, but they don't wanna do that. Workers that get promoted into the specialist tier will not automatically demote themselves into the worker tier. They don't wanna go back to slaving away on a farm. They've got a really nice cushy job right now. Why would I do that? So be very careful when you're creating new jobs for your for your population, that you don't produce so many specialist jobs that all of your workers get promoted and now, oh, you've got no energy credits, you've got no minerals, you've got no food. My camera just died because it's like 83 degrees in my room right now. So I'm gonna take a quick pause, put my camera in the refrigerator and we'll come back to the tutorial in just a minute. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so it's been a little bit more than a quick pause. It's actually been several days since I recorded the first half of this video, but let's just jump right back into it. So I talked a little bit about how you wanna make sure that you don't produce too many specialist buildings because your population will actually start to promote themselves up the different strata in the population tab here. Workers wanna become specialists, specialists want to become rulers. Eventually, if there's really no work for them, your specialists will demote themselves to workers, but this takes a very long time. The other problem with building too many buildings, and especially what new players do that I would recommend you don't do, this is the biggest mistake that new players do when it comes with, to their planets, is don't build more than you need at the moment. And the reason for that is because every single district and every single building in the game has an upkeep cost. You can see that in the tooltip, if you scroll over it, you can see it in the tooltip of the districts there too, called upkeep. And that is a cost that you are going to be charged, whether people are working that job or not. Just to have the machinery and the buildings on your planet, they cost something to run. Now, of course, with production buildings like the research labs, the actual cost of production, the jobs upkeep, will be charged against your galactic income if you have people working those jobs. But the buildings themselves, just to exist, have an upkeep cost. What a lot of new players do is they end up with this massive surplus of minerals, for instance, like we have now, and they decide, well, to save myself the trouble, I'm just gonna build a bunch of generator districts. But if you don't have the population to work those jobs, you are actually losing money and you're not getting anything for it in return. So be really careful about what buildings and what districts you build and how many you build at one time. You can always go to the build queue and either cancel something by clicking on it, or if maybe you built them out of order, but you still wanna keep all of those items in the build queue, you can use these arrows to move them around or you can shift click uh, an item like the civilian industries to move it all the way to the bottom or to move it back up to the top. I'm gonna cancel those generator districts for now, but something worth knowing, you shouldn't build buildings unless you actually have a need for them. My goal that I set for myself when I play Stellaris and my goal for new players too, is to always have about 
two to five available jobs on a planet. That seems to be the really nice sweet spot between making sure that you have available jobs so that the time of your employees isn't wasted, but not having so many that you have a ridiculously uh, high upkeep that you're not actually getting some kind of benefit out of. So those are really the most important elements of planets. Again, just a really quick orientation. We've got the planet's habitability, its size, which determines how many districts you can have. You've got your city districts, which unlock new building slots, and you've got some technologies, and I think possibly also some traditions that open up additional building slots here as well. It's not just city districts, but this is the primary way to get those. You've got all of your information here in the upper right-hand panel. So your stability tells you how productive your population will be on that planet. This is just how many pops are living there. You've got crime amounts, which is determined by both stability and your population's happiness, which is determined from, do they have amenities? Do they have consumer goods? Do they have housing, right? These top three here, especially crime, housing, and amenities, always keep an eye on them. You've got the number of jobs you have available that are unfulfilled currently in your uh, on your planet, and you've got unemployment. And if this number is ever read, something is going wrong. Now, in the latest updates to Solaris, your population eventually will exceed the number of jobs you can even have on a planet. And if that ever happens, you can actually resettle your population from one planet to another. This costs unity to do, and so it can be a little bit expensive to do. You'll notice that we actually currently cannot press the resettlement button, and that's because one of the following must be true. Either we have a policy where we allow resettlement, which is typically the general way that people enable this, or if you're a Gestalt consciousness, that is if you're kind of a hive mind and, and you don't have to worry about the individual whims of, of your population, you can do it no problem. Or if we have robots that just work for us, that, that don't have their own uh, you know sapience, their own thought processes, we can just send them wherever we want. In our case, we must have a policy that is not enabled at this moment, and it's preventing us from resettling our population from Earth to uh, Alpha Centauri, if that's what we want to do. We haven't talked about the policies tabs, but it, it, uh, the policies tab, but it's on the left side menu. And if you open this up, there is a bunch of stuff here. These uh, will are kind of like how your government runs itself. What are your official government stances? And these policies determine a lot, a lot in the game. It determines: Are you able to enslave populations? Are you able to? Settle your pop, your pops. Are you able to go to war just for claiming territory that your opponents own? There are a lot of policies here. We'll probably cover this in its own tutorial video, but the one that is important for us is the resettlement policy. And the resettlement policy is just kind of a yes or no. Do we allow it or do we not allow it? Now, if you imagine in the mind of a populace, right, in, in a world like this, Resettlement is the government telling you, you must leave Earth and go to a new planet, to go to a new colony that we deem fit for you. And so, you know, more egalitarian societies where, where people have their own rights and their own, you know, wills and their own desires and expectations that they think that they can fulfill, they don't particularly like it if the government says you must leave. We tell you, you must go. And so if you allow resettlement, this is going to give you a little bit more flexibility to move your population around, but it might make your populace a little bit less happy with you. We'll talk about policies and the effect of policies on your empire and on factions, which we'll get into later. Uh, but for now, just know that if you are being blocked somehow by something that says you don't have the right policy, it's in the policies tab. You can go through these and look through them. Let me just tell you, they've got big, big, big effects on your gameplay and on your success in the game as well. So we'll get back to that later. For now, we're gonna look at planets. So we've kind of covered Earth, right? There's one last thing I want to bring up, and we kind of talked about this a little bit with Alpha Centauri, which is there are 18 available districts on this planet because we have a planet of size 18. But you'll notice that three of these districts uh, out of our total five that we can make because we've, we already have 13, 
Three of them are blocked. They've got this red slash through them, and I can't actually build more than two generator districts, even though the planet supports a total of five more. Why is that? It's actually in the word blocked. They are called blockers, and blockers are found in the features panel, which you open up by pressing features. And in here, uh, not only can we see some basic information that describes why can we build eight agriculture districts? Why can we build eight generator districts? It's actually because of the features on this planet. We've got the Saharan Irrigation Project, and all of these are randomly determined for every planet in the game. But these determine what is the maximum number of each district that you can have? Remember, your generator districts, mining districts, and agriculture districts, these are determined by your planetary features, but you can always have an unlimited number of city districts and industrial districts up to your planet's maximum size. Now, we've got these three blockers here that are preventing us from building any more than two additional districts. If we want to build more than that, we've got to clear out the blockers by spending some energy in this case to do so. You can hover over each one of the blockers to see exactly what it is blocking. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is really unfortunate, uh, is blocking three uh, uh, agriculture districts. So if we want to turn this into an agricultural planet, we would probably want to clear that blocker. Uh, not only that, it is reducing the number of maximum districts on this planet by one. So while this will allow us to build our three agriculture districts, when I unclear this blocker, it's actually only going to unblock a single agriculture district to be built. Okay, second so sort of makes sense. It has a maximum district limit and it has a maximum agriculture district limit. So if we want the, to use the full potential of Earth, we've got to clear out all of our blockers. For most species in the game, you start with a blocker on your home planet that if you clear it out, gives you one population. Pops are incredibly valuable. Remember, population is what does everything. They mine up resources, they turn resources into advanced resources, they do everything for us. So clearing out the sprawling slums as soon as you possibly can is a really good idea and it's really cheap to do it. I think most players would trade 300 energy for one population any day. So I'm gonna throw this in the queue for Earth as well because it's going to give us access to an additional pop. That's freaking sweet. Always check your planetary features to see why you can't build additional districts. It's just here in the in the features tab. Cool. Now, there's two last things that are actually connected to each other that you should know about planets. And that is sectors. I can't really show you the power of sectors yet because we don't own a lot of space. But a sector is a region of space centered around a capital sector planet. To start, your capital sector planet is your only planet that you own, right? It's your capital planet. And a sector allows you to recruit a governor, which is a special type of leader, just like scientific leaders are, and generals, and um, and lieutenants are. Are they called lieutenants? No. Triple check. Admirals, of course. Um, and this governor will give you benefits across the entire sector. All of the planets in that sector will be benefited in some way. So if you really don't particularly like your governor, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to new players, but you can get into this if you want to, if you want to really min-max your empire, you can click on the governor of your home sector and choose to recruit a new one. And just like scientists and admirals and, uh, and generals, all of your potential uh, governors have different traits on them. I don't think it's worth you spending too much unity for this, but if you get into a really specific situation where a governor would make or break your success in the game, you can always come back to this and play around with it. We'll probably cover this also, sorry, there's a lot of this, in a future tutorial when we have a little bit more space and a few more planets under our belt. But those are the basics of planetary um, management, right? Find planets that are habitable for your population, that have green habitability, ideally. 
really focus on taking those systems into your space and uh, and building out your borders to meet them. Planets on choke points like this one in Asterion are really, really good for a reason I'm gonna get into in just a little bit. But any planet that has green habitability or above is really good for you to grab. And remember, your goal ideally is to specialize a planet into a single or two or maximum three things. That is stuff like this will be a planet that produces minerals, or this is a planet that just produces technology and really focuses on technology, or it's a planet that really focuses on building unity so I can get traditions more quickly, or this is an industrial planet, a planet that's building a lot of industrial goods, a lot of consumer goods, and a lot of alloys. And I wanted to just do that thing. Ideally, you should try to specialize your planets based on their strengths and weaknesses. Cool. So in two seconds here, Alpha Centauri is going to be colonized. I've unpaused the game. I'm gonna speed things up just so that we see that happen. And uh, just there, we get access to a brand new planet. Planets, when they are freshly colonized, typically start with pretty high stability, right? Nothing bad has happened. Things are actually kind of kind of good. And uh, they start with typically one population, but depending on your traditions and your technologies, you may start with more than one pop. Population grows over time when conditions are good on that planet, and population can actually decline if you are, say, killing off a certain population. If you've taken a planet from a uh, an enemy species and you're just kind of you're axing that species because you don't want to deal with them. Uh, there's a lot of different effects that that uh, can affect the growth on population, but the primary one is a stat called population growth. Uh, population growth is a is a stat just like creating uh, science is an ability or creating alloys is an ability, and you can get special buildings that you can build down here that increase your pop growth on that planet, which will make it so that your population grows faster than it would otherwise. It's a pretty strong move to do, but by no means do you have to do that on every single planet. If that's not the route that you want to take your empire, that's totally fine. You can play the game the way that you want to play it. So on a brand new colony, you start with zero districts. You start with a single building called the Reassembled Ship Shelter. Imagine, remember, that colony ship has landed and we have sort of torn it apart, kind of like the Expanse, right? Uh, the, the colony that they, that they go and visit. We've torn that colony ship apart and it is literally just parts of the ship that are turned into ramshackle buildings that people are working out of. We don't really have a unified government center or even a city built yet. That's what you're going to do on each one of the planets that you colonize. To start out, we identified that Alpha Centauri makes a pretty good generator district. Uh, sorry, a, a pretty good uh, energy planet. It makes actually a pretty good mining planet as well. There's a lot of minerals here. Remember, we got those that raw minerals trait. And it makes a garbage agricultural planet, so I'm not even going to think about that, right? But if I were to choose for something for this planet, I would probably choose a generator district planet and turn all of the districts into generator districts. So I'm going to do that. To start, I'm going to build probably two generator districts. Remember, you don't want to build too many because the upkeep is going to have a reoccurring cost on your on your entire empire. And I will probably build a building here. That might be a little bit extra. That might be a little bit too much. But if there was a particular building that I really felt was a strong move for, for this planet, I would probably build a building up. Early buildings you can build, commercial zones will give you trade value, uh, hollow theaters will give you um, uh, amenities and unity. Those are two pretty strong starting planets for most uh, non-robotic, non-hive-minded empires to start with. Uh, the other one that you might choose is administrative offices, but I don't think we have that many consumer goods to really turn consumer goods into unity. So I'm just gonna avoid that one for now. I would probably go with one of these two. I'm looking at my stats here when I make these decisions and I see green across the board, two housing. I'm gonna get four more from my districts. Only one job, I'm gonna get four more from my two generator districts also. And keep in mind that this is a balancing act on this planet. If your population decides to work in the generator district, you will produce less amenities. 
If they work in a generator district, instead of working elsewhere, you're going to get a lot of energy, but not a lot of your other resource. So really keep that in mind when you're choosing what districts to build and what order you wanna build your districts and your buildings as well. This is probably the number one question I've been asked for this series is how do I administrate my planets? And the easy, easy, easy kind of checklist to check off is, am I specializing them? Have I looked in the outliner to make sure that I don't have any icons here? Because seeing icons here is kind of a bad thing, usually, right? It follows the same system as the red, green, and yellow icons or numbers on your list here. Yellow icons, they're not terrible, but ideally you wouldn't have them. Red icons, that goes, well, that's not good. Let's figure out what's wrong with them. Cool? Cool. So that is basic planetary administration. The last two tabs here, you don't have to worry too much about holdings if you're a new player, ignore this for now. But armies is something that's maybe worth you thinking about. You can build planets that are designed to be massive planetary fortresses. All they are designed to do is hold gigantic armies. And these can be incredibly powerful, strategic, defensive planets for you. Best placed on a choke point. I'll show you what this looks like in the future as we expand out. But for now, it's time to unpause, get rid of some of these pop-ups that are popping up. Let's grab a new tradition. I'm gonna take faith in science because I said we were gonna take this whole row here and then finish off the discovery tree. And let's grab our construction ship now and start taking a bunch more systems. We've got Sirius here with a habitable planet. I definitely want to grab that. Let's get three, right? And then after Sirius, I probably want to take maybe a star base up here. We've got these two halves of our of our empire, a uh, half that kind of moves off to the right and a half that moves off to the left. Now, in the super early game, we've got actually a really powerful thing that seems like it's a it's kind of a downside to us, but actually it's a really powerful thing. And that is we have hostile ships in Vilmar. And that seems bad, right? Those hostile ships might come attack us. They won't, don't worry, that's not how it works. But if there are any maybe less than savory aliens on the right side of our space and they encounter this system, they, like us, are probably gonna back off and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't wanna deal with that. I'm not interested in that, I'm out of here. So keeping this kind of group of hostile alien vessels, I think if I'm not mistaken, this was the mining, uh, the mining vessels that we found out about. Keeping them there and not destroying them can actually be a really powerful defensive advantage to us. I'm gonna expand our empire to the right, but I kind of also wanna expand it out to the left so we can grab this powerful choke point, right? It's a, it's a really important defensive position for us. So to do that simultaneously, I'm actually gonna build in the shipyard a new construction ship. Remember, I clicked on the, uh, the station here that we had upgraded for us automatically, and I went into the shipyard and I built a new ship. That was really fast because I was on fastest speed. And I'm gonna have that one head up this way and start building star bases out in this direction. Cool, one at a time until we grab this uh, this position here. And then for the most part, I'm kind of safe. I'm kind of defended against my uh, uh, potential, potential aggressors, right? We can build up a defensive position there. We can build up a star base that has gun uh, defense towers and can hold off a small attack force against any aliens that might attack us. Now, on the screen, we see what is probably one of the most overwhelming and confusing elements of Stellaris in the early game, especially for new players, and that is factions. Remember how I talked about how policies have an effect on your empire and may make people in your empire happy or a little bit less happy? That is through the lens of factions. And we are going to look at this in the next episode. So we're going to take a look at what are factions? Why are they important? Are they even important at all? And how do you keep your factions appeased? Or how could you possibly do things that might anger your factions? Why is that sometimes okay? And why is that sometimes a really, really bad idea? We'll look at that next time. Until then, thank you so much for watching. 
appreciate you uh, uh, staying tuned with the series. I'm glad you're all enjoying it. I'm getting so much positive feedback about the series and it's really just great to hear that it's helping you all. If it is, don't forget to let your friends know. If they're getting into Solaris, let them know about the series. It would really, uh, it would really help. Like the, uh, like the video, subscribe. Let me know down in the comments if there's anything more about planets that you would like to know. And next time we'll talk about factions and maybe even get into a little bit of trade value because that's something that is kind of worth knowing but not really explained very well. Until then, have a great time. See you soon. Enjoy your travels in space.